Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity you can do together instead of sitting around answering the same questions over and over again? Have you checked out two lap books yet? If you haven't, you're missing out on something that I am certain you and your loved ones will thoroughly enjoy. Two lap books have changed many of the visits I've had with mom tremendously. These simple read aloud books were created specifically for memory challenged adults. You see, people living with Alzheimer's eventually lose their ability to initiate conversation with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and beautiful, colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, we can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Reading these books together could very likely bring out memories you can cherish together. There's a link in the show notes to the My Favorite Things page on my website. The page is linked to the Amazon pages of all my favorite books and products that have helped me with my mom over the years. Definitely check it out. I'm certain you'll find something that will help you like they helped me. That's why I created this page for you. And if you ever run across something that is beneficial to your life and helping you with your loved ones, please let me know. Hey, listeners, you're going to love today's episode. You see, I'm always looking for experts and people who have experienced things on this Alzheimer's journey that I have not experienced. And today I bring to you the Psychology in Seattle podcast, and we talk about how to talk to kids about what's going on with grandma. You know, she's getting a little scary. She's asking me the same question. She's asked me what grade I'm in five times, and she's just not acting like grandma, and I'm concerned and confused. So we talk a little bit about that. We also talk about other emotions and things tied into caregiving and coping with a loved one who is forgetting us and losing their memories and everything that goes along with being on this journey. So again, this is a shared podcast with Psychology in Seattle. You might want to check them out, but let's dive in and listen to what Kirk's got to talk about. So Jennifer, what did you want to talk about today? Well, A topic that I haven't dealt with personally would be how to tell younger children what's going on with grandma when grandma starts repeating things, forgetting what they've told her, that type of thing. My daughter is almost 27. My mom's been pretty much on this journey with Alzheimer's for about 18 years. So she was old enough as it started that she understood what was going on. I have a niece and nephew who are, well, my niece is almost 13 and my nephew is nine. So they didn't have the benefit of maturing as the disease progressed. And I felt it would be a useful conversation to have for my listeners who have younger children or younger grandchildren, and they might not understand what's going on. Cause sometimes it can be a little, it's a little scary, a little confusing, yeah, and also the way that people react around them can also be of note when you have family, you know, adults who are um awkward or they don't know or so in general, I mean, I suppose it's a part of a larger conversation. It's like how do all of us as a family um you know, cope or quote unquote, deal with someone who has, or deal with the, the, um, downsides, I suppose. And the, the thing that I've observed, cause I, my grandma, she didn't have Alzheimer's, but she definitely had dementia. She lived to be 101. And so her memory faded uh, over time. I just saw my family deal with it in a lot of different ways. And, you know, when she was younger, she was very much a part of conversations. We would, uh, make jokes together. You know, she, she was a part of the social makeup of any sort of 
big gathering with family. But as she got older, it was harder for her to do that. And as a group, it was unclear sometimes what we were supposed to be doing. And so I think for younger kids, they might pick up on that. They might say like, Oh, are, so is, are we just ignoring grandma now? Is that, is that the, is that the deal? Is that what we're supposed to be doing? Um, do you ever see that kind of thing? Yeah. Before my father passed away, we would have, I would have lunch with them or sometimes my husband and I would have lunch with them and especially in the last couple of years. Now my dad passed away about 18 months ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, thank you. So the last lunch I had with my parents was November 1st, 2016. And my mom does not really initiate conversations anymore. And she definitely has extreme difficulty participating in them. And she did back then as well. And the conversation would be more between my father and I, and I, I didn't really know how to not exclude her because she didn't participate. And, you know, I felt guilty because it's kind of rude. She's sitting there and we're just chatting away. And it's, and I've seen that in group settings that, you know, it's, it's very challenging for them to participate in conversations even in the moderate stages of the disease because their brain isn't processing as quickly as ours is. And, and they do kind of get left out or in some cases, some people might react in a negative way because they're being ignored or being treated like a little kid and, you know, basically being treated in a negative way. And so, yeah, I have seen that it is, it's a really big challenge. And sometimes the way a person living with Alzheimer's reacts to things can be a little bit scary if you don't understand what's going on in their mind. And that takes a lot of understanding. And I, I attend a support group. And so I've learned a lot and I've learned a lot doing my podcast on like what's going on in their mind. And that helps to understand their reactions to things, but obviously young children wouldn't have that benefit. So it's, it's definitely, it's a definite challenge. So what is going on in their mind? Can you explain that? Well, every Alzheimer's, everybody, every person living with Alzheimer's is different. I, many years ago, listened to a gal talk about dementia in general. And she said, think of it as somebody opening your multi-drawer filing cabinet, reaching in and just flinging papers out and then closing the drawer. And you would have no idea that those papers were missing until you went looking for them. So the papers is somewhat of a metaphor for the memories. You don't realize that you don't remember things until you're trying to recall them and they don't happen. A lot of people don't understand what's going on. They know something's wrong, but they don't know what's wrong. So they get very concerned. They, you know, they get a little panicky. I mean, you know, something's wrong with you, but you don't know what, nobody really seems to see that something's wrong with you. And it obviously generates fear, panic, confusion. All those are not really great things to be feeling. And that's why a lot of people in the more advanced stages of the disease lash out. Sometimes they get violent. My grandmother also had Alzheimer's and there was an instance where my aunt pulled into the driveway. My aunt was her caregiver. My grandmother, who was all of five foot, jumped out of the car and ran down the street like my aunt was going to kill her because my grandmother was confused. She had no idea what was going on and she just knew she needed to get away from this scary situation, even though my aunt took wonderful care of her. My aunt would never have hurt her. So it was just, it was terrifying for my poor aunt because my grandmother was running towards traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. Yeah, it's, and like I said, everybody living with Alzheimer's is different because as I'm sure you know, every human is different. The disease affects every human brain differently. So it's, it's not as if, well, you know, my mom reacted like this and your dad reacted like that and her grandmother reacted like that. And they're all the same. It's, there are similarities, but there's as many differences as there are similarities, which makes the challenge of how to help your loved one, how to help 
how to go through this journey with them more difficult. Right. And what I, I don't know actually that much about it. I'm not an expert on it, but from personal experience, what I have found is that the goal with the individual who has the memory issues is to help figure out the formula of activities or interactions that they can enjoy or participate in. Um, With my grandma, when she was in her last few years, a lot of that had to do with things that were very immediate, like interacting with um, her great grandkids, for example. She didn't have to remember who they were. She didn't have to um, speak for a long period of time, but she could smile at a toddler and play with a toddler and, um, and she loved it, you know, and we loved it with her and we loved, you know, the whole activity. And so, um, I'm guessing my family people, my, cause my aunt took care of my grandma, uh, figured out, you know, there's certain things that she will respond to, um, that doesn't, um, involve her memory issues. Have you found that to be true? Definitely. The, actually, the reason I started my podcast was in a desperate attempt to find ways to connect with my mom so that we had more meaningful visits other than her saying, so what have you been up to every minute and a half to two minutes the entire time I was there? And none of the suggestions that are typical worked. And that was super frustrating because it made sense. Look at old family photos And that was actually more painful than not because my sister and I are polar opposite personalities. We're also almost opposite in looks. I'm blonde and sunburn at the drop of a hat. She's brunette, olive skin, tans in five seconds. There's not a lot of similarities. And yet my mom could not remember that the blonde baby in the pictures was me. And I'm sitting right there with her. So that was definitely not the way I wanted to connect and somewhat out of desperation. And after spending the winter with her at the memory community that she lives in, I just decided one day I'm like, I got to get the heck out of here. So I took her for a drive up to a regional park. That's super close to where she's at. We looked at the trees and the sky. It was February. So it was cold. And she enjoyed that so much that I'm like, okay, as soon as it's warm, we're coming back. And we've done that a few times. I did take her and a friend of hers who also lives in the memory community to our city park that has a splash zone for kids to play in. And it was before school started. It was in July. It was hotter than Hades. And the two ladies enjoyed it so much. They're both moms. They're both grandmothers. I was afraid I was never going to get them out of the park. Yeah. It was like 105 degrees. It was like, ladies, I'm melting here. <laughs> I'm about to ready to go play in the splash zone with the kids. So they, they both, and my mom especially, love to do anything where they can just sit around and watch young kids. So I do that with her a lot. Right. So if families know uh, how to trial and error that, and I'm guessing it's not that hard to figure out, right? I mean, there's pretty easy things to experiment with, like what you experimented with, what my family experimented with. Um, actually, with my grandma, uh, old pictures did help her. Um, maybe not of babies, but of... Because, you know, if you're 101 years old, uh, most of your uh, family members have been adults <laughs> during their life. And so, um, so I actually made her a one of those like online photo books that you can make, you know, mm-hmm. and made a, a page for every person. And, and I showed pictures of them through their life, you know, so, you know, her, her son, um, uh, Ron, I would have him as a baby and then him as a teen then him as a, you know, through the years. And so, um, and I gave it to her thinking, um, it was a good, you know, birthday present a number of years ago, uh, or I, just a random birthday present. Really, I didn't think that it because I give I like to make photo books, and so people so they're like, oh, great. And then I, I I'm guessing they never look at it. <laughs> it was just fun for me to make. But my grandma looked at this photo book, 
every morning. She got up every morning and, and would look at this book. And I think it helped her to um, recognize people and to sort of make sure it kept people in her mind. Um, and so every year I would make her another photo book as sort of, then I you know, made one about her life and people she knew before I, you know, before my time. And, um, but yeah, so just trial and error and, and trying to figure that out, uh, is, is the key. Cause I find that people want to connect with their, um, grandparents who have, or anyone who has memory issues, but if they aren't given the tools or they don't know how, then, uh, by default, I think a lot of people just sort of back away because they're, they're feeling really awkward about it. And it's difficult. My mom doesn't remember what our specific relationship is. She thinks I'm her really good friend. Her friend thinks I'm her cousin and that's difficult to deal with. I'm lucky because it kind of happened gradually. It wasn't like all of a sudden she forgot me. And that's kind of interesting to me. So I'm kind of grateful for that. And I don't know. I did. I took her wedding album one day with me and we looked through that and she recognized herself and my dad and the parents, but not really anybody else, including her siblings. And I thought that was somewhat interesting. And that's kind of where I started with the, okay, I can't go visit her every week and have the same conversation and not feel frustrated because she doesn't remember I'm there. If I leave and use the ladies room and come back two or three minutes later, it's as if I had just shown up. So it's really easy to justify short visits you know, I got a lot of work to do me this week. Maybe I'll skip it, but I don't feel like that's appropriate. So I was desperately looking for ways to connect. And I thought, well, you know, she likes to look at the sky. She likes to look at the trees. And that's what led me to taking her to the park where the kids were. And now I'm searching out ways to do that even more. So it was definitely trial and error. And you have to be committed to doing that because it's, it's a challenge. It's frustrating. And I use the term dealing with someone, especially a parent. It's like death by a thousand cuts. You know, she doesn't remember I'm her daughter. She doesn't remember my birthday. She doesn't remember I was there two minutes ago. It's just after a while, it's, you know, you have to go home and hug the dog. (laughs) Yeah. How is it for you? How does it feel? It's, it's challenging. And I find if I'm tired or stressed, because right now life is bonkers busy and I'm finding that my patience with her is not where it should be. And getting frustrated with somebody with memory loss is a recipe for having a very unpleasant afternoon. My mom doesn't get violent or ugly even though she was always a really stubborn personality. So I'm lucky there. We haven't dealt with that yet. It could still come, but I find it's very difficult to be with her where she's at in her reality. If my brain is okay, I got to go home and take care of the dogs and do the dinner. And da, 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 da. You know, my brain is spinning with all the things I need to do. And it's very difficult to slow down to her I don't want to say level because that sounds negative, but to be in her reality is to be in a very slow, quiet place, just sitting and staring at the tree or the sky or the children. I can do that for about 20, 30 minutes. And then I'm like, man, I should have brought my laptop with me. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's a good thing for you to slow down. Yeah. And it's, and normally when I don't feel under a lot of pressure, it's easier to just spend an hour and a half, two hours in her reality. But when I feel like if I'm not doing these three things right now, I need to be doing these five things over here right now. And that's, what's been going on for the last month or so in my life. It makes it very difficult to be able to just take a deep breath and say, it's okay to spend an hour and a half staring at the nature and the trees and, and she's not super communicative at this point. She does still talk, 
Uh, many Alzheimer's patients end up nonverbal at the end. She's not there yet, but she doesn't really initiate conversations because I don't think she remembers that she hasn't, that we've been sitting quietly for 10 minutes. Yeah. So for a lot of people that I've worked with, um, and I suppose for myself, a dominant experience is one of grief. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, the, the death by a thousand cuts, as you're saying, it's like you very, you know, when, when someone dies, then, you know, they're here one minute and they're gone the next and it's horrible. And the uh, grief can be tremendous. And when someone slowly loses their memory and even their personality to some extent, it's just a very slow loss. And so even though um, for some people it's like, well, yeah, my mom is still alive, but I feel like a few years ago I lost her, but I didn't know I lost her. But now I, 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 I mean, I've, I've definitely lost what we used to have, you know, and how's that experience for you? That's exactly how I feel. My mom was, very creative. She did, she was an excellent seamstress and she used to paint with acrylics back when I was younger. And in her later years, she actually did woodworking and was getting quite good at it. So now one of the suggestions is, well, simplify the tasks or the hobbies that they enjoyed and do that with them. That doesn't work with my mom either. And when I go see her, you know, she doesn't wear makeup anymore. She doesn't dry her hair. It just air dries. She, you know, so it, she doesn't look like my mom, but she is my mom. It's yeah, it's, it's challenging. And I just went through this, this week, the last out of the last seven times I've seen her, and there've been a couple extra times because of doctor visits and the holiday. And um, my sister brought her to my niece's production of the lion King. The last six of seven times I've seen her, she's had the same outfit on. So I talked to the care staff where she lives and I said, is she giving you a hard time about getting dressed? Because the challenge one has with somebody in the later stages of Alzheimer's is you have to think for them and you have to make decisions for them, but you still have to treat them like an adult, even though they don't function like an adult. It's, it's a really delicate balancing act. And they told me, yes, she was giving them grief about getting dressed, but she was also giving them grief about showering. I'm like, okay, well, that explains a few things. What had turned out is they had moved her shower to the evening. And my mom has always been a daytime showering person. So I had to deal with, you know, strongly suggesting they move it back because it would benefit everybody. And they have. So it's just interesting that you have to make those decisions for me. You have to ask these questions and, you know, eventually, you know, you end up, they end up incontinent. So they end up in diapers and it's like, you know, you're going backwards in your life. They're going backwards in their life. They, they end up becoming like your child and your baby. And it's not fun. <laughs> yeah. Is it hard to have, uh, I mean, I, I'm guessing that prior to her losing her uh, memory that, you know, you had a relationship with her, you were close with her. Was it hard mm -hmm. to lose? Was it hard to lose that part of your relationship, or do you still feel like you have that? No, it was. It's definitely been a gradual loss. Like I said, she doesn't remember what our relationship is. She does know that I'm an important person in her life, which I I use that as kind of a little bit of solace. Okay, she doesn't remember that I'm the oldest of the two kids she had, but she knows that I'm important and I'm special and you know, that's, that's okay. I mean, it's almost semantics. She started having memory loss about the time her mom was having significant memory loss and she was very good at hiding it, but we had a business together and it became very obvious to me that I had to make sure that I knew what she was telling clients and, 
and I knew what they wanted done with their orders. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that I'm actually a professional photographer as well. And we had a photo studio and a film until about 2003. We had a film process, you know, one hour photo lab. And she would take orders from people with no directions, no due dates, no nothing. And then forget what she told them that she would do or they asked her to do. So I got to the point where I was hovering. I'd hear her talking to clients. So I'd come out and join in, so to speak, and then say, oh, you know, what are we going to do for Kirk today? And, and just casually insert myself into the conversation so that I had a clue. And there was a day I found an order in her handwriting, no, no explanations, no nothing, <laughs> just giant question mark. And I said, what are we supposed to be doing for Mrs. Smith? And she looked at it and said, well, I don't know. That's the employee's handwriting. And I'm like, no, that's your handwriting. This is the employee's handwriting. And she looked at it, turned around, stomped off in a huff. And I thought, oh, this is great. And we had had a conversation where she told me, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. I'm like, well, that's great. What do you want me to do about it? Because murder is illegal. And I knew she was going to, because at that point it was obvious she was having problems. She was pretty good at hiding it from most people, but I was with her all day, five days a week. And that was hard because you have to supervise your parent who is generally a self-sufficient adult, has been married for, let's see, about 40 plus years at that point. You know, it didn't feel right that I had to supervise her. It was That was challenging. And then when they retired and I brought the business to my hometown, it was a relief, but I was also concerned because I thought I knew that interacting with clients and meaningful work was good for her, but I seriously couldn't take the supervising and the hovering and the monitoring. So I worried about that. And I worried about her and my dad being together all the time because his patience wasn't great. And I knew that dealing with her was frustrating. And it just it's just kind of been a gradual shifting of the relationship from her being my mom and supporter and mentor kind of person to, you know, now I'm the one that's taking care of her, encouraging her, you know, helping her along the way. And trying to figure it all out as I go along too. Because as I said, every person with Alzheimer's is different. So I can't ask my friend, well, hey, what did you do when your mom did X? Because my mom probably isn't going to do the exact same X as this other person's mom. And and the solution to that may not be the same either. So it's it's always a challenge. You got to be creative. Yeah. Well, if there's an award for a you know, best daughter, I think uh, you'd be up for it. Well, thank you. I do sometimes feel guilty. My father assumed that my mom would come live with me. My sister has her in-laws with them. Um, They are independent, just poor. And they do need, um, I saw her mother-in-law yesterday. They do need a little bit of assistance, but not like my mom. And My dad never discussed that with me and my daughter moved out a month before he passed away. So while he was assuming mom would come live with me, I didn't even have a spare room. Like I didn't know where he thinks I was going to put her. So that's interesting. Well, another factor is that I'm sure you're aware of is that uh, unless you're planning on being there 24 seven, it's not necessarily a viable option uh, for safety to um, have them live with you. That's true. And I work from home, but she needs, she needed, she needed stimulation. I'm sure you're aware that isolation is, is horrible for all of us, but it's very bad for our seniors, regardless of if they have cognitive issues or not. If, if they don't, a lot of social isolation can lead them down that path, which we don't want them to go down. And my sister and I had discussed a couple of options for mom's care. One of which would be moving her, my aunt who cared for grandma in with my mom. There's a lot of reasons that that should have worked well, but there became, you know, you know how families are there. There were some red flags that started waving 
And I realized that wasn't the option that we really should go down, but I needed to bring my sister along, making sure she, she had the time to make that decision herself. My sister doesn't take, you know, if I say, no, that's not how we're going to do it. We need to do it like this. That's just asking for trouble. So I started looking around at the options for mom. And the reason that I, that my, I did and my sister agreed to the, the memory community is because they have activities and there's a lot of socialization. And my mom doesn't do the activities because I think she, she recognizes that it's too much challenge. She doesn't want to push herself, which I find frustrating and sad. But what she does do is sit around and chat with the other old ladies for hours. And that's great because I can't do that with her. I lose my mind. So your grandma had Alzheimer's and your mom has Alzheimer's. Do you worry about having it yourself one day? Yep. I made um, a lot, huge lifestyle changes to lose 100 pounds, mostly because on my paternal side of the family, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very large history of diabetes. And anybody that knows anything about obesity knows that that's a risk for diabetes. So I was... I had a double barrel shotgun pointed at my head and I finally said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to lose this weight. And I did. And I've kept most of it off turning 50 and then dealing with all of this with my parents, my dad going in the hospital for a month and then on hospice. And then you can probably appreciate this. He was on hospice. My oldest dog died. My daughter moved out. Then my dad died. And then we put my mom in the memory community all in about a month and a half. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was the beginning of last year. Wow. How did you cope with that? Uh, a lot of mental strength. I was seeing a counselor for a while. I had to put that on hold because of crazy stuff that's going on. My husband is running for city council of our town here, and that has sucked up every last second of free time for both of us. So um, putting her on hold was not my first choice, but... It was kind of necessary. So we, he and I talked to each other a lot, but yeah, it was, it was a challenging situation. And my sister dealt with it differently than I do. Cause like I said, we're polar opposite people and having to navigate how I felt and being respectful to how she felt while it was different, but reasonable. It was, it was a very big learning experience. <laughs> I'm just glad 2017 is over. <laughs> so do you do anything to, prepare for the possibility of having Alzheimer's? Cause I think about this myself cause my, my uncle had early onset Alzheimer's and I think about like, well, you know, there's a chance that I could get it at some point. And my, well, for my uncle, it was a similar thing with your mom in that he tried to hide it or didn't know it was happening or something. And he ended up getting fired from his, uh, he was an architect and a very successful one for many years. And uh, for a couple of years, things started going downhill for him at work. And then he ended up um, getting fired, or, you know, and that was really hard for him. I'm sure. And, yeah. And I, I, for me, I sort of accept, or at least I think I accept the inevitable growing old process and dying and possibly losing function of some things, including my mind. And I don't want, you know, it'll be horrible, you know, to go down that road, but I also don't want to make it horrible for people around me. <laughs> and so I um, have resolved that if I ever do discover significant issues along those lines, I'm going to immediately make a plan with everyone around me. Um, but after hearing different stories, I wonder if I'll forget that I had a plan to begin with, you know, um, or I'll be so uh, in the moment and proud that I won't be able to um, initiate it or something. Cause it'll just be like, well, I got a few more years left in me or something. I don't know. And, uh, I don't know. Like, do you have any preparations like that? I'm working on it to back up half a step. 
there is a lot of research and evidence that says lifestyle choices, they don't necessarily predict, but obviously being sedentary, being overweight, poor nutrition, maybe being somewhat antisocial, those are all bad things. So we need to, we need to move our bodies to, you know, and, and challenge ourselves physically because that helps grow new brain cells and it makes them stronger. Because a lot of people think, well, I'm, you know, I'll be 52 in November. And a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm too old to learn new things. Well, that's baloney. I've learned so much starting my podcast this year that I should have a PhD at this point. <laughs> and then nutrition is also, you know, it's, it's the same thing they always tell us, diet and exercise, but there's also dynamic learning. And that's any kind of learning where you actually have to think, learning a new language, learning new dance steps, you know, learning how to be a social media manager to promote a brand new podcast. And that now of city council campaign and anything that takes concentration. I had a friend that said, yeah, I do crossword puzzles every day. Cause you know, I don't want to get dementia. And I said, well, I hate to break it to you, but my mom did crossword puzzles too. And she just laughed and looked at me like, Oh, you know what, what else can I do? And so I've learned a lot about, preventing it because my paternal grandmother, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, she's a hundred and a half today and she's totally fine. Her mind is fine. She's physically fine. She is mostly blind from glaucoma. So she really shouldn't be living on her own, but you don't tell people that are a hundred anything they don't want to hear. So, and my grandmother lived to 91. So I, I tell people I'm all, I'm at the beginning of stage two. So I do everything I can to, to follow the steps that they suggest to ward off the, it, the disease or at the, the worst case scenario to prevent the worst parts of it for as long as possible. So your original question was to talk about how to talk with young people about grandma or grandpa having memory issues. What have you done so far? Um, well, like I said, I didn't have to have that conversation with my daughter. She was in middle school when it became obvious to those closest to my mom that something was going on. And she'd obviously known my maternal grandmother and had seen what she had gone through from afar. And so I didn't have to explain like, well, you know, we saw grandma last Christmas and she was fine. And this Christmas she's asking you, you know, what, what grade are you in again? And, and, and how old are you again? And so I, I have never had to go through that personally. And that's why I reached out to you to see if you had suggestions for people who, you know, their loved one might not be close or they might not see them regularly, you know, maybe some tips on how to talk to the kids. So they're not afraid of grandma. Yeah, well, like you said, it depends because every person with memory issues is different. Some people are going to be like with my grandma and her memory issues. She came across as very pleasant and wouldn't scare kids. So, um, but I, but other people with memory issues might come across. You know, they might have, um, you know, emotionality, or they might look like they're. Um, not doing well health wise or something. And, and that can be scary to, to younger kids. So it, it really kind of depends, but I think it, it all depends on the goal and the sort of context. Like if you're with, you know, you have two kids, they're, you know, preschool and elementary school age and you visit grandparents once a year, then that's a different context than if you're seeing grandma, grandpa, every week. Um, and it also depends on what you want out of it. You know, some people really, really want their kids to have a, to have a relationship with their, with their parents, with the grandparents. Um, some people don't really care about that. They're just like, well, you know, if it happens, it happens, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put, push it. Some, some grandparents with, uh, memory issues, great-grandparents 
you know, really want relationships with the young ones and their family. And some don't, you know, some, some older people are just like, yeah, you know, I've, I've been a parent already. I'm, I'm cool. (laughs) I don't need to interact with the little ones. I'm fine. Um, they'd rather have conversations with people their own age or whatever. And so I think it just has to really be tailored to that situation. But in general, yeah, I mean, uh, you're talking to your kids and, just helping them understand what's going on so that if anything happens, they're not confused by it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you just tell the kids. So grandpa has a a condition that a lot of older people have some, some older people have in which he has a really hard time remembering things. And that makes it hard for him to to remember even who you are. And so, whereas, you know, Uncle Danny remembers you from every time that he he sees you. Well, Grandpa George um, might not actually remember you. And so we just have to keep that in mind that that's not because he doesn't love you. It's because he has a brain condition that makes it hard for him to remember. Um, You know, just kind of going through that with the kids so that they're not hurt or confused by what ends up happening. The other thing is, is, Again, if your goal is to have them connect, then um, just engineering uh, uh, interactions for grandparents and children, great grandparents and children, that neither they don't have to um, think about very much. You know, like um, if you know your older relative likes to, um, I don't know, throw the ball around or something, um, then you don't sort of wait for that to happen. You engineer it. You just, you know, you get grandma, you get the kids and you're like, let's go throw the ball outside. And you go outside and, you know, you're sort of the ringleader and and you have to kind of monitor how things are going. And, you know, that can be a wonderful way to uh, have a relationship and to, to, you know, carry on those connections and those traditions through the, through the generations but it can be hard, you know, like with your, with your mom, uh, it'd be, if, if you had young kids, five, six years old, it might be really hard to do that. Um, uh, what, like if you did have a seven year old daughter now, what would you do, uh, given the way your mom, uh, their, her preferences and the way that she acts in her current state, if yeah. my daughter was seven instead of almost 27 yeah, and knowing what I've learned, which has been a huge benefit, I, I would encourage them to take walks and look at the trees and the nature. Cause that's what my mom likes to do and maybe try to encourage the two of them to do the color. Although my mom has a very difficult time with the spatial relationships of what is inside the lines and what is outside the lines. And she gets confused, frustrated, and then stops. So I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily suggest coloring that way. We've done, my mom and I have done puzzles with her friend, mostly, uh, you know, sorting the pieces by the straight edge, something that's simple because there's a huge benefit when, our seniors and the younger children connect. And that's, that would be something that I would encourage my mom and my daughter did a lot of baking together. So under the right circumstances, I might try to encourage that. And as I, you know, and that would definitely be easier if my mom was in more of a moderate stage, but she needs to be constantly reminded of if you, a couple of, holidays ago probably was 2015 she you know she and my dad were over and she kept saying what can I do to help what can I do to help and you know it's rude and wouldn't help by my saying go sit over there in the corner so I gave her a very simple smash these candy canes up for the top of the cake and I had to remind her multiple times it would have been faster for me to do it but I let her do it because it made her feel productive and you know, I wasn't in a giant hurry to get that part done anyway. And that's the kind of thing I would do with her and my daughter. If, you know, as long as I could supervise, because if she was seven, yeah, they both need supervision. 
mostly simplify what my they enjoyed doing together when my mom was better. Yeah, well, I again, I'm just um impressed and uh, heartened by the level of uh love and commitment you have you have towards your family and um a lot of people um ju- I think justifiably don't know what to do and and have a hard time with it um but you've really leaned into the situation over the years and uh, really you know bit by bit done your best to you know make your mom's life better and uh, and make your whole family's life better that's you know really commendable thank you i i don't want to lose her and regret well i wish i had tried harder I wish I wasn't so busy with the campaign or the business or this or that. You know, it's, we don't die with an empty inbox. There's always things that we would like to do. And so my, my goal with my grandmother and my dad and my mom is just, I don't want to have regrets. I want to do the best job I can. And eh, if I fall a little short, at least I tried. I didn't, I didn't put her in a care facility and, and call it quits because that just doesn't feel right. And it, there's days when I think, yeah, I have so many things to do. Maybe I'll just skip it this week. But I don't because I don't know. I don't know why I don't. <laughs> I haven't given myself permission to do that. Well, it's been an interesting conversation. Um, any final words or would you like to uh, uh, say something about your husband's campaign? Maybe some <laughs> listeners are in your district. Well, he's the most qualified candidate there's one incumbent, quote unquote, running. Where? Oh, we're, oh, sorry, duh. <laughs> we are in Brentwood, California. That is in Northern California, not the Brentwood where OJ Simpson lived. That's the other end of the state. We're basically the last suburb that could commute to San Francisco for work, although I would never do it because it's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I work from home for a reason. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. So, what's his name? That his name is ready- John. John Fink, he's been a planning commissioner for almost nine years, so he has a lot of experience and a lot of compassion, and he's, he's got almost too much integrity. I always tell him, you know, just ask forgiveness. You don't have to always ask for permission, but he never does that. So he's what our city needs, and so I'm helping. Even though there are days I'd just rather not deal with Alzheimer's or politics <laughs> Go walk the dog and take pretty pictures is what I'd rather do. But it's important to him. So we're working on this again. He ran in 2016 and came in third. So hopefully this time will be it. Well, uh, Jennifer, I think you definitely deserve a vacation. I I hope that you get one. Um, Me too. And uh, uh, yeah, I think I think if anyone I've talked to in recent weeks deserves a vacation, it's you. Uh, Thanks for joining me on the podcast, Jennifer. It's been great. Definitely. Thanks for sharing the episode with me. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you really deserve it. You really do. So what did you think of that conversation? Kind of went a few places I hadn't planned. We talked a little less about how to tell children what's going on with our family members, whose memories are, are leaving But I think it was really good, and I really, really enjoyed sharing a podcast episode with another podcaster. It was it was really cool. So I hope you got as much out of that as I planned, and I look forward to talking to all of you next week again. And stay tuned because I'm going to be bringing you a lot of really cool stuff in November. Have a great week. Definitely check out the show notes or even the webpage for each episode. I include a lot of additional useful information every week. And definitely check out the My Favorite Things page because I created that specifically so that you did not have to hunt down some of the best books and tools to utilize with your loved one. Now, stay tuned at the end of the episode because I've got something special coming up for you again. There's so much useful information out there and so much we need to know to take care of our parents and our own families. And I know sometimes it's really hard to gather all this information together in a short period of time. 
in a way you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast. I share what I've learned taking care of my parents and especially my mom and all the researching of information I do for these podcast episodes. I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, could you do me a favor? Can you go to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or even a quick review? This is how new people find my podcast, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. As always, I'll chat with you again next week. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400. Stay tuned for another promo from a podcast that I really enjoy, something that lifts me up and and gives a little humor to my life. The For Better or Worse podcast is a couple who don't agree on TV and movies much, so they force each other to watch their favorites, and sometimes it's torture, and sometimes they come around to the other person's point of view, and it's always fun. So take a listen. Hello, everybody. This is Jason. And Aaron. And we are the hosts of the For Better or Worse podcast. Like most couples, we have pretty different tastes. There's a lot of things we agree on, of course, but it can be pretty difficult to find something to watch at the end of the day. She likes comedies, love stories, and dramas. And he likes anime, horror, sci-fi, and fantasy. So we both thought it would be fun to force each other to watch our favorite movies, shows, or anything else we can think of and record it here for you guys. The show is a lot of fun, and it's not always torture. Sometimes we actually come around to each other's side. We would love for you guys to give us a shot. So download, for better or worse, anywhere you listen to your favorite shows, and join us in the fun. We can't wait to share our experiences with you.